Stroke of Luck, written and read by Mark Billingham. So many things that could have been different. An almost infinite number of them. The flight of the ball, the angle of the bat, the movement of his feet as he skipped down the pitch, the weather, the time, the day of the week, the whatever. The smallest variance in any one of these things, or in the way that each connected to the other at the crucial moment, and nothing would have happened as it did. An inch another way, or a second, or a step and it would have been a very different story. Of course, it's always a different story, but it isn't always a story with bodies. He wasn't even a good batsman, a tail-ender for heaven's sake, but this once he got everything right. The footwork and the swing were spot on. The ball flew from the meat of the bat, high above the heads of the fielders, into the long grass at the edge of the woodland that fringed the pitch on two sides. Alan and another player had been looking for a minute or so, using hands and feet to move aside the long grass at the base of an oak tree, when she stepped from behind it as if she'd been waiting for them. Don't you have any spare ones? Alan looked at her for a few long seconds before answering. She was tall, five seven or eight, with short dark hair. Her legs were bare beneath a cream-coloured skirt, and her breasts looked a good size under a sleeveless top. She looked Mediterranean, Alan thought, sophisticated. I suppose we must have somewhere, he said. So why waste time looking? Are they expensive? Alan laughed. We're only a bunch of medics. It costs a small fortune just to hire the pitch. You're a doctor? A neurologist, a consultant neurologist. She didn't look as impressed as he'd hoped. Got it! Alan turned to see his teammate brandishing the ball, heard the cheers from those on the pitch as it was thrown across. He turned back. The woman was holding a hand up to shield her eyes from the sun. Will you be here long? Alan said. She looked hesitant. He pointed back towards the pitch. We've only got a couple of wickets left to take. She dropped her hand, smiled without looking at him. You'd better get on with it then. Listen, we usually go and have a couple of drinks afterwards, in the woodman, up by the tube. Do you fancy coming along? Just for one, maybe? She looked at her watch. Too quickly, Alan thought, to have even seen what time it read. I don't have a lot of time. He nodded, stepping backwards towards the pitch. Well, you know where we are? The woodman was only a small place, and the dozen or so players, some from either team, took up most of the back room. I'm Rachel, by the way, she said. Alan. Did you win, Alan? Yeah, but no thanks to me. The other team weren't very good. You're all doctors, right? He nodded. Doctors, student doctors, friends of doctors. Anybody who's available if we're short. It's as much a social thing as anything else. Plus the sandwiches you get at half time. Alan put on a posh voice. We call it the tea interval, he said. Rachel eked out a dry white wine and was introduced. She met Phil Hendricks, a pathologist who did a lot of work with the police and told her a succession of grisly stories. She met a dull cardiologist whose name she instantly forgot, a male nurse called Sandy who was at great pains to point out that not all male nurses were gay, and a slimy anaesthetist whose breath would surely have done the trick were he ever to run short of gas. While Rachel was in the ladies, a bumptious paediatrician Alan didn't like a whole lot dropped a fat hand onto his shoulder. Sodding typical. You do fuck all with the bat and then score after the game. The others enjoyed the joke. Alan glanced round and saw that Rachel was just coming out of the toilet. He hoped that she hadn't seen them all laughing. Do you want another one of those? Alan pointed at her half-empty glass before downing what was left of his lager. She didn't, but followed him to the bar anyway. Alan leaned in close to her, and they talked while he repeatedly failed to attract the attention of the surly Irish barmaid. I don't really know a lot of them, to tell you the truth. There's only a couple I ever see outside of the games. There's always tossers in any group, she said. It's the price you pay for company. What do you do, Rachel? She barked out a dry laugh. Not a great deal. I studied. It sounded like the end of a conversation, and for a while they said nothing. Alan guessed that they were about the same age, 
She was definitely in her early thirties, which meant that she had to have graduated at least ten years before. She had to have done something, had to do something. Unless, of course, she'd been a mature student. It seemed a little too early to pry. What do you do to relax? Do you see mates, or... She nodded towards the bar, and he followed her gaze to the barmaid who stood finally ready to take the order. Alan reeled off a long list of drinks, and they watched while the tray that was placed on the bar began to fill up with glasses. Alan turned and opened his mouth to speak, but she beat him to it. I'd better be getting off. Right, I don't suppose I could have your phone number. She gave a non-committal hum as she swallowed what was left of her wine. Alan handed a twenty-pound note across the bar, grinned at her. Mobile? I never have it switched on. I could leave messages. She took out a pen and scribbled the number on the back of a dog-eared beer mat. Alan picked up the tray of drinks just as the barmaid proffered him his fifty pence change. Unable to take it, Alan nodded to Rachel. She leaned forward and grabbed the coin. Stick it in the machine on your way out, he said. Alan had just put the tray down on the table when he heard the repetitive chug and clink of the fruit machine paying out its jackpot. He strode across to where Rachel was scooping out a handful of ten-pence pieces. You jammy sod, he said. I've been putting money into that thing for weeks. Then she turned and Alan saw that her face had reddened. You have it, she said. She thrust the handful of coins at him. Then, as several dropped to the floor, she spun round, flustered, and tipped the whole lot back into the payout tray. I can't... I, I haven't got anywhere to put them all. She'd gone by the time Alan had finished picking coins off the carpet. It didn't take too long for Rachel to calm down. She marched down the hill towards the tube station, her control returning with every step. She'd been angry with herself for behaving as she had in the pub, but what else could she do? There was no way she could take all that loose change home with her, was there? As she walked on, she realised that actually there had been things she could have done, and she chided herself for being so stupid. She could have asked the woman behind the bar to change the coins into notes. Those were more easily hidden. She could have grabbed the coins, left with a smile, and made some beggar's day. She needed to remember. It was important to be careful, but she always had options. She reached into her handbag for the mints, popped one into her mouth to mask the smell of the wine, the taste of it. As she walked down the steps to Highgate Station, she dropped a hand into her pocket, groping around until she could feel her wedding ring hot against the palm of her hand. There was always that delicious, terrifying second or two as her fingers moved against the lining of her pocket when she thought she might have lost it. But it was always there, waiting for her. She stood on the platform, the ring tight in her fist until the train came in. Then, just as she always did, she slipped the ring, inch by dreadful inch, back onto her finger. Lee pushed his chicken madras round the plate until it was cold. He'd lost his appetite anyway. He'd ordered the food before the row, and now he didn't feel like it, so that was another thing that was Rachel's fault. She'd be in the bedroom by now, crying. She never cried when it was actually happening. He knew it was because she didn't want to give him the satisfaction or some such crap. That only proved what a stupid cow she was because he couldn't stand to see her cry, to see any woman cry. And maybe if she did cry once in a while, he might ease off a bit. No, she saved it up for afterwards. And he could hear it now, coming through the ceiling and putting him off his dinner. The row had been about the same thing they were all about. Her taking the piss. He'd backed down on this afternoon walking business, on her going out to the woods of an afternoon on her own. He'd given in to her, and today she'd been gone nearly six hours. Half the fucking day, and no word of an apology when she'd eventually come strolling through the front door. So, it had kicked off. Lee was bright, always had been. He knew damn well that it wasn't just about her staying out of the house too long. He knew it all came down to the pills. There'd been a lot more rowing, a lot more crying in the bedroom since he'd found that little packet tucked behind her panties at the back of a drawer. He was clever enough to see the irony in that as well. Contraceptive pills hidden among the sexy knickers he'd bought for her. 
He'd gone mental when he'd found them, obviously. Hadn't they agreed that they were going to start trying for a kid? That everything would be better once they were a family? He was furious at the deceit, at the fool she'd made of him, at the time and effort he'd wasted in shafting her all those weeks beforehand. There'd been a lot more rowing since. Christ, he loved her, though. She wouldn't get to him so much if it wasn't for that, wouldn't wind him up like she did. He could feel it surging through him as he lost his temper, and it caused his whole body to shake when it was finished, and she crawled away to cry where he couldn't see her. He hoped she knew it, now, with her face buried in a sopping pillow. He hoped she knew how much he loved her. Lee dropped his fork and slid his hand beneath the plate, wiggling his fingers until it sat, balanced on his palm. He jerked his forearm and sent the plate fast across the kitchen, watched his dinner run down the wall. He watched them. He lay on the grass, just another sun worshipper, and with his arm folded across his head, he spied on them through a fringed curtain of underarm hair. He watched them from his favourite bench, his face hidden behind a newspaper, his back straight against the small metal plaque for Eric and Muriel, who loved these woods. He watched them, and he waited. He watched her, of course, at other times, too. He'd followed her home that very first day, and now he would spend hours outside the house in Barnet, imagining her inside in the dark. He couldn't say why he'd chosen her, couldn't really say why he'd chosen any of them. Something just clicked. It was all pretty random at the end of the day. Just luck, good or bad, depending on which way you looked at it. When he was caught, and odds on he would be, he would tell them that and nothing else. It all came down to chance. They'd begun to spend their afternoons together. They walked every inch of Highgate Woods, ate picnics by the tree where they'd first met, and one day... They held hands across a weathered wooden table outside the cafeteria. Why can't I see you in the evenings? Alan said. She winced. This is nice, isn't it? Don't rush things. I changed my shifts around so we could see each other during the day, so that we could spend time together. I never asked you to. There's things I want, Rachel. She leered. I bet there are. Yes, that. Obviously that. But other things. I want to take you places and meet your friends. I want to come to where you live. I want you to come where I live. It's complicated. I told you. You never tell me anything. I'm married, Alan. He drew his hand away from hers. He tried and failed to make light of it. Well, that explains a lot. I suppose it changes everything, doesn't it? He looked at her as if she were mad. Just a bit. I don't see why. For fuck's sake, Rachel. Tell me. I don't... I wouldn't like it if I was the one married to you. Put it that way. She looked at the table. Don't cry. I'm not crying. Alan put a laugh into his voice. Besides, he might decide to beat me up. Then there were tears and she told him the rest the babies she didn't want and the bruises you couldn't see. And when it was over, Alan reached for her hand and squeezed and looked at her hard. If he touches you again, I'll kill him. She appreciated the gesture, but knew it was really no more than that. And she was sad at the hurt she saw in Alan's eyes when she laughed. Afterwards, Rachel leaned down to pull the sheet back over them. A little shyness had returned, but it was not uncomfortable or awkward. I would tell you how great that was, she said, but I don't want you to get complacent. She turned on her side to face him and grinned. I was lucky to meet you, he said, that day looking for the ball. Or oh, unlucky. He shook his head, ran the back of his hand along her ribcage. Did you know that a smile can change the world? She said. Do you know about that idea? Sounds like one of those awful self-help things. No, it's just a philosophy, really. 
based around the randomness of everything, how every action has consequences, you know? How it's connected. She closed her eyes. You smile at someone at the bus stop, and maybe that person's mood changes. They're reminded of a friend they haven't spoken to in a long time, and they decide to ring them. This third person, on the other side of the world, answers his mobile phone doing 90 miles an hour on the motorway. He's so thrilled to hear from his old friend that he loses concentration and ploughs into the car in front, killing a man who was on his way to plant a bomb that would have killed a thousand people. Alan puffed out his cheeks, let the air out slowly. What would have happened if I'd scowled at the bloke at the bus stop? Rachel opened her eyes. Something else would have happened. Right, like I'd have got punched. She laughed, but Alan looked away, his mind quickly elsewhere. I want to talk to you later, he said. I want to talk to you tonight. She sighed. I've told you, it's not possible. After what you told me earlier, I want to call you. I want to know you're okay. There must be a way. I'll call at seven o'clock. Rachel? At exactly seven. She closed her eyes again. Then, 15 seconds later, she nodded slowly. It was a minute before Alan spoke again. Only trouble is, you smile at anyone at a bus stop in London, they think you're a nutter. This time they both laughed, then rolled together, then made love again. Afterwards they talked about all manner of stuff, films and football and music. Nothing that mattered. Alan lay in bed after Rachel had left and thought about all the things that had been said and done that day. He wanted so much to do something to help her, to make her feel better. But for all his bravado, for all his heroic notions, the best that he could come up with was a present. He knew straight away what he could give her and where to find it. It was in a shoebox, at the back of a cupboard stuffed with bundles of letters, a bag of old tools and other odds and sods that he'd collected from his father's place after the old man had died. Alan hadn't looked at the bracelet in a couple of years, had forgotten the weight of it. It was gold, or so he presumed, and heavy with charms. He remembered the feel of Rachel's body against his fingers, her shoulder blades and hips, as he ran them around the smooth body of the tiger, the edges of the key, the rims of the tiny train wheels that turned. After his father's death, Alan had spoken to his mother about the bracelet. He asked her if she knew where it had come from. The skin around her jaw had tightened as she'd said she hardly remembered it, then in the next breath that she wanted nothing to do with the bloody thing. Alan put two and two together and realised how stupid he'd been. He knew about his father's affairs and guessed that, years before, the bracelet had been a failed peace offering of some sort. It might even have been something that he'd originally bought for one of his mistresses. His father had been a forensic pathologist, and Alan was amazed at how a man who exercised such professional skill could be so clumsy when it came to the rest of his life. It wasn't surprising that his mother had reacted as she had, that she'd wanted no part of the charm bracelet. It had become tainted. Alan was not superstitious. He sensed that Rachel would like it. He wouldn't give it to her as it was, though. He would make it truly hers before he gave it. He knew exactly what charm he wanted to add. From Muswell Hill, it was a five-minute bus ride to Highgate Tube. Rachel leaned back against the side of the shelter. Her hair was still wet from the shower she'd taken at Alan's flat. She'd thought so often about how she might feel afterwards. It had been a vital part of the fantasy not just with Alan, but with other men she'd seen, but never spoken to. The sex had been easy to imagine, of course. It had been gentler than she was used to, and had lasted longer, but the mechanics were more or less the same. Where she'd been wrong was in imagining the feelings that would come when she'd actually done it. She'd been certain that she'd feel frightened, but she didn't. Fear was familiar to her, and its absence was unmistakable. Heady. She waited a couple of minutes before giving up on the bus and heading for the station on foot. Had there been anybody else at the bus stop, she might well have smiled at them.
Lee didn't think that he asked too much. Not after a long day talking mortgages to morons and assuring mousy newlyweds that damp was easily sorted. At the end of it, all he wanted was his dinner and some comfort. He couldn't stand her so fucking cheerful. Taking off his jacket and tie, opening a beer and asking just what she was so bloody chirpy about. Had she been up to those sodding woods again? Yes. Who with? Don't be silly, Lee. Sucking off tramps in the bushes, I'll bet. Then she'd laughed at him. No outrage like there should have been. No anger at his filthy suggestions, at the stupid suspicions that he'd only half tarted up as a joke. A jab to the belly and another to the tits had shut her up and put her down on the floor. Now he straddled her chest, knees pressed down onto her arms, his hands pulling at his own hair in frustration. We were going to do the business later on. I was well up for it, and tonight could have been the night we did something special. Made a new life, Lee. Please, you fucking spoiled it. We can still do it, Lee. Let's go upstairs now. I'm really horny, Lee. He shook his head, disgusted, gathering the spit into his mouth. She knew what was coming. He could see it in her eyes, and he waited for her to try and turn her head away as he leaned down and pushed the saliva between his teeth. Instead, she just closed her eyes, and he thought he saw something like a smile as he let a thick string of beery spittle drop slowly down onto her face. As soon as the seven o'clock news had begun, Alan reached for the phone and dialed the number. It was answered almost immediately, but nobody spoke. Alan whispered, realised as soon as he had that he was being stupid. He wasn't the one who needed to be secretive. Rachel, it's me. Suddenly there was a noise, above the hiss and crackle on the line. It was a guttural sound that echoed, that took him a few moments to identify. An animal sound, a gulp and a grind, a splutter and a swallow. It was the sound of someone sobbing uncontrollably, but trying with every ounce of strength to assert control, trying desperately not to be heard. Alan sat up straight, pressed the phone hard to his ear. Rachel, I'm here, OK? I'm not going anywhere. He watched the comings and goings with something like amusement. For a fortnight, he watched her leave the house in Barnet mid-morning, then come home again by late afternoon. He stayed with her most of the day when he could, saw her meet him in the woods, or sometimes go straight to his flat when they couldn't be asked with preliminaries, when they wanted to get straight down to it. He watched her leave the flat, eyes bright and hair wet, the smell of one man scrubbed away before she went home to another. He wondered if the man he saw climbing into the silver sports car every morning knew that he was a cuckold. On a couple of occasions, he thought about popping a note under his windscreen to let him know, just to stir things up a bit. He hadn't done because he didn't want to do anything that might disturb the routine, not now that he was ready to take her. Besides, Mischief for its own sake was not his thing at all. Still, he couldn't help but marvel at the things people got up to. On the day Alan had hoped to give Rachel the bracelet, his mother tripped on the stairs. So many things that could have been different. Two weeks before, the jeweller had shown him a catalogue. There had been charms that would have carried more or less the same meaning, but Alan knew what he wanted. He'd ordered one specially made. He'd decided against the diamond spots and gone for the enamel, but still, it wasn't cheap. He'd thought of it as a dozen decent sessions with one of his private patients. He always thought in those terms whenever he wanted to splash out on something. A fortnight later, half an hour before he was due to meet Rachel in the woods, he walked out onto Bond Street with the bracelet. Then his mother called. Don't worry, Alan. It's just my ankle. It's nothing. A message that said, Come and see me now if you give a shit. He phoned Rachel and left a message of his own. She was probably on her way already, was almost certainly somewhere on the northern line. He made for the underground himself, 
steeling himself for the trip to his mother's warden-controlled flat in Swiss Cottage. As he walked, he realised that his mother would see the bag. It was purple, with white cord handles and the name of the jeweller in gold lettering. He couldn't show her the bracelet, for obvious reasons. He decided that if she asked, he'd tell her he'd bought himself a new watch. Lee wasn't stupid. God, it would all have been a lot easier if he were. But it couldn't be very much longer before he noticed how often she was going to the toilet or taking a shower just before seven o'clock. She collected her bag on the way upstairs. Then once she'd locked the bathroom door, she switched the phone on, set it to vibrate only, and waited. Tonight she was desperate. Had been since Alan had failed to meet her at lunchtime. She'd waited in the woods for twenty minutes before she'd got a signal, before the alert had come through. She'd listened to his message once, then erased it, as always, walked back towards the tube, unravelling. Sitting with her back against the side of the bath, she thought there was every chance that he might not ring at all. His excuse for not turning up had sounded very much like an excuse, not that she could blame him for wanting to call a halt to things. She knew how hard it was for him in so many ways. She almost dropped the phone when it jumped in her hand. Where were you? Didn't you get the message? I was at my bloody mother's. I thought you might have made it up. Jesus, Rachel. Sorry. A sigh. Half a minute of sniffs and swallows. God, I wish I could see you, he said. Now, I mean. I've got something for you. I wanted to give it to you this afternoon. I'd like to see you too. Can you? The hope in his voice clutched at her. There might be a way. By the tree. In half an hour. The woods don't shut until eight. I'll try. When she'd hung up, she dialed another number. She spoke urgently for a minute, then hung up again. When she heard the landline ringing a few moments later, she flushed the toilet and stepped out of the bathroom. Lee was holding the phone out for her when she walked into the lounge. She took it and spoke, hoped he could hear the shock and concern in her voice, despite the fact that he hadn't bothered to turn the television down. That was Sue, she said afterwards. Her brother's been in a car accident. Some idiot, talking on his mobile phone, ploughed into the back of him on the motorway. I said I'd go round. Lee's team had been awarded a penalty. Without turning round to her, he waved his consent. He was astonished to see her leave the house alone at night. The husband did, of course. Jumped in his sports car every so often to collect a takeaway or shoot down to the off-licence. But never her. He'd been planning to do it during the day. He knew the quiet places now, the dead spots en route, where he could take her with very little risk but he wasn't a man to look a gift horse in the mouth. This was perfect, and he was as ready as he'd ever be. He presumed she'd be heading for the tube at High Barnet. He got out of his car and followed her. It took Alan ten minutes to get to the woods. By half past seven, he'd got everything arranged. He hadn't wanted to just give her the bracelet. He'd wanted her to come across it to find it as if by some piece of good fortune. Luck had played such a big part in their coming together after all, which is why he'd chosen the charm that he had. There was only really one place that he could leave it. The light was fading fast. The few people he saw were all moving towards one or other of the various exits. He dialed her number. It's me. You're probably still on the tube. Listen, come to the tree, but don't worry if you can't see me. I'll be nearby, but there's something I want you to find first. Stand where the ball was found, then look up. OK? I'll see you soon. He moved away from the tree so that he could watch from a distance when she discovered the bracelet. It worried him that it would soon be too dark to see the expression on her face when she found it. He sat down, leaned back against a stump to wait. It was the away leg of a big European tie, and one up at half-time was a very decent result. Lee was at the fridge, digging out snacks for the rest of the game, when the car alarm went off. 
That fucking Saab across the road again. He told the tosser to get it looked at once. The wailing stopped after a couple of minutes, but started up again almost immediately, and Lee knew that the uninterrupted enjoyment of the second half had gone out of the window. He picked up his keys and stormed out of the front door. The prat was out by the looks of it, but Lee fancied giving his motor a kick or two anyway. He might come back afterwards, grab some paper and stick a non-too-subtle note through the wanker's letterbox. Maybe a piece of dog shit for good measure. Rachel's phone was lying on the tarmac halfway down the drive. Lee picked it up and switched it on. The leather case had protected it and the screen lit up immediately. He entered the security code and waited. There was a message. Rachel had realised her phone was missing as soon as she came out of the station. She knew Alan would be worried that she'd taken so long and had reached for the phone to see if he'd left a message. A balloon of sickness had risen up rapidly from her guts and she'd begun running, silently cursing the selfish idiot who'd thrown himself onto the line at East Finchley, then feeling bad about it. A few minutes into the woods and still a few more from where Alan would be waiting. It was almost dark and she hadn't seen anyone since she left the road. She looked at her watch. The exits would close in ten minutes. She knew that people climbed over fences to get in, morons who lit bonfires and played chase me with the keepers, so it wouldn't be impossible to get out. But she still didn't fancy being inside after the woods were locked up. She thought about shouting Alan's name out. It was so quiet that the sound would probably carry. She was being stupid. Still out of breath, she picked up her pace again, looking up at the noise of feet falling heavily on the path ahead and seeing the jogger coming towards her. Alan rang again, hung up as soon as he heard her voice on the answering machine. He looked at his watch, leaned his head back against the bark. He could hear the distant drone of the traffic and closer the shrill peep of the bats that had begun to emerge from their boxes to feed, moving above him like scraps of burnt paper on the breeze. He slowed as he passed her, jogged on a stride or two, then backed quickly up to draw level with her again. She froze, and he could see the fear in her face. Rachel? he said. She stared at him, still wary, but with curiosity getting the better of her. I met you a few weeks ago in the pub, he said, with Alan. Her eyes didn't move from his. Graham, the cardiologist? Oh, God, Graham, right, of course. She laughed, and her shoulders sagged as the tension vanished. He laughed too, and reached around to the belt he wore beneath the jogging bottoms, felt for the knife. Sorry, she said, I think my brain's going. I'm a bit bloody jumpy, to tell you the truth. He nodded, but he wasn't really listening. He span slowly around, hand on hip, catching his breath checking that there was no one else around. Well, she said, he'd have her in the bushes in seconds, the knife pressed to her throat before she had a chance to open her mouth. He saw her check her watch. It's time, he thought. Rachel! He looked up and saw the shape of a big man moving fast towards them. She looked at the shape, then back to him, her mouth open and something unreadable in her eyes. He dug out a smile. Nice to see you again, he said. With the blade of the knife flat against his wrist, he turned and jogged away along the path that ran at right angles to the one they'd been on. Was that him? Was that him? He was a jogger. He just... Lee's hand squeezed her neck, choked off the end of the sentence. He raised his other hand slowly, held the phone aloft in triumph. I know all about it, he said. So don't try and lie to me. There were distant voices coming from somewhere. People leaving. Laughter. Words that were impossible to make out and quickly faded to silence. Lee tossed the phone to the ground and the free hand reached up to claw at her chest. Thick fingers pushed aside material, found a nipple and squeezed. She couldn't make a sound. The tears ran down her face and neck and onto the back of his hand as she beat at it, as she snatched in breaths through her nose. 
Just as she felt her legs go, he released her neck and breast and raised both hands up to the side of her neck. Lee, nothing happened. Lee! He pressed the heels of his hands against her ears and leaned in close as though he might kiss or bite her. What's his name? She tried to shake her head, but he held it hard. Or oh, so help me, I'll dig a hole for you with my bare hands. I'll leave your carcass here for the foxes. So she told him, and he let her go, and he shouted over his shoulder to her as he walked further into the woods. Now! Run home! Alan had given it one more minute ten minutes ago, but it was clear to him now that she wasn't coming. She'd sounded like she was really going to try, so he decided that she hadn't been able to get away. He hoped it was only fear that had restrained her. He stood up, pressed the redial button on his phone one last time, got her message again. There were no more than a couple of minutes before the exits were sealed. He just had time to retrieve the bracelet, to reach up and unhook it from the branch on which it hung. He'd give it to her another day. Standing alone in the dark, wondering how she was, he decided that he might not draw her attention to the newest charm on the bracelet. A pair of dice had seemed so right, so appropriate in light of what had happened, of everything they'd talked about. Suddenly he felt every bit as clumsy as his father. It seemed tasteless. Luck was something they were pushing. He stepped out onto the path, turned when he heard a man's voice say his name. The footwork and the swing were spot on. The first blow smashed Alan's phone into a dozen or more pieces. The second did much the same to his skull and those that came after were about nothing so much as exercise. It took half a minute for the growl to die in Lee's throat. The blood on the branch, on the grass to either side of the path, on his training shoes, looked black in the near total darkness. Lee bent down and picked up the dead man's arm. He wondered if his team had managed to hold on to their one-goal lead as he began dragging the body into the undergrowth. Graham had run until he felt his lungs about to give up the ghost. He was no fitter than many of those he treated, those whose hearts were marbled with creamy lines of fat like cheap offcuts. He dropped down onto a bench to recover, to reflect on what had happened in the woods, to consider his rotten luck. If that man hadn't come along when he had... A young woman with Mediterranean features was waiting to cross the road a few feet from where he was sitting. She was taking keys from her bag, probably heading towards the flats opposite. She glanced in his direction, and he dropped his elbows to his knees almost immediately, looked at the pavement, made sure she didn't get a good look at his face. The next High Barnet train was still eight minutes away. Rachel stood on the platform, her legs still shaking, the burning in her breast a little less fierce with every minute that passed. The pain had been good. It had stopped her thinking too much, stopped her wondering. She sought a little more of it, thrusting her hand into her pocket until she found her wedding ring, then driving the edge of it hard against the fingernail until she felt it split. Alan had thought it odd that she still took the ring off even after she told him the truth but it made perfect sense to her. Its removal had always been more about freedom than deceit. An old woman standing next to her nudged her arm and nodded toward the electronic display. Correction. Hi, Barnet. One minute. There's a stroke of luck, the woman said. Rachel looked at the floor. She didn't raise her head again until she heard the train coming.